And now, another family treasure is coming to video. Walt Disney's classic... Disney's The Fox and the Hound on video. It will always be friends forever. No. When most people hear The Fox and the Hound, their minds tend to go to the colorful 1981 animated feature from Walt Disney Studios, but comparatively few seem to know much about the novel it was supposedly adapted from, or the circumstances surrounding it that, through a bizarre series of events, forever changed the state of American animation. In 1967, American animal trainer and naturalist author Daniel P. Mannix released The Fox and the Hound, chronicling a fictional rivalry between a hunter and his hounds and a local fox amidst the backdrop of a rural landscape undergoing gradual development. In writing the novel, Mannix aimed to portray his animal characters as realistically as possible, even going so far as to raise a pair of foxes for over a year. The novel released to commercial success and critical acclaim, and this brought it to the attention of Disney who secured the film rights almost immediately after the book's release. The Fox and the Hound is an important work in the genre of naturalist animal xenofiction, which I first touched upon in my video on the Animals of Farthing Woods series. Works in this genre, or more accurately, subgenre, are told from the perspective of non-physically anthropomorphized animals. Unfortunately, there is a tendency among audiences to label these types of stories as for children, and while some works are intended for younger audiences, plenty of them are not. But that doesn't stop people from seeing things through their preconceived lenses. Novels like White Fang and Watership Down are often to this day categorized as children's literature, despite their graphic subject matter and sophisticated prose. And I can feel myself going off on a tangent here, so I'll try to stay focused. Sorry. It's just that people unjustly dismissing an entire genre or medium as childish really bothers me. The point I was erratically making my way towards is that The Fox and the Hound is by no means a children's novel. Its depiction of animal behavior and life in the wild is unrelentingly brutal, and underlying the graphic violence that punctuates the story is an even bleaker message about the alienation of humanity from their environment. Here, I'll briefly delve into some of the major plot elements. So, spoiler warning, but if this sounds interesting, I highly recommend that you read the book. It was only recently made available as an ebook on Amazon after spending decades out of print. The story follows the developing rivalry between a huntsman, simply referred to as the Master, and Todd, a local fox that was briefly raised by humans after being orphaned. The master originally owns a number of hounds, among them the older Copper, his most experienced tracker, and Chief, a much younger dog. While hunting a bear, Copper is reluctant to attack the beast, even when it threatens the master, but Chief rushes in and saves the man, earning him the master's praise and causing Copper to grow bitter with jealousy. Meanwhile, Todd, after returning to the wild upon reaching maturity, learns to evade hunting hounds, and finds amusement in taunting them when they are chained up. This continues for some time until one day Chief's chain breaks, allowing him to give pursuit. The Master, seeing this, follows with Copper, just in time to witness Todd lead Chief in front of an oncoming train, resulting in the dog's brutal death. The rest of the novel then chronicles the increasingly desperate and violent rivalry between man and dog and fox as the former two utilize many different techniques in their quest for revenge. The master trains Copper to ignore the scent of all other foxes save Todd, dead set on avenging Chief. Over the years, Todd secures a number of mates, but they, along with his kits, are killed in gruesome ways by the vengeful master, including being lured in with calls and shot, caught and mangled in leg hold traps, and even gassed in their dens. As all of this occurs, the rural valley in which the story takes place undergoes steady suburbanization, with the master finding himself increasingly isolated from both his fellow man and the land in which he lives. He descends into alcoholism, selling off much of his land and hunting pack to avoid destitution, leaving only himself and copper. When an outbreak of rabies spreads through the local wildlife, however, the master once more finds purpose when his neighbors come to him for aid. He begins using poisoned bait, which not only pushes the fox population to the edge of extinction, but wreaks havoc on local pets as well, and ends up resulting in the death of a human child. Forced to abandon his most effective technique, the master then resorts to using greyhounds, but Todd, now much older and less vigorous, still manages to narrowly escape them. In the end, 
Topper picks up Todd's scent one morning when out with the master, giving pursuit one final time. The chase drags out through the night and into the next morning, where an exhausted Todd drops dead as his weary, aging body gives out. Copper, on the verge of death himself, collapses atop his mortal enemy's corpse. The master manages to nurse his beloved hound back to health, with the pair receiving praise for killing the long-elusive Todd, the last remaining fox in the entire valley. But as the afterglow of victory fades, the man's family members once more begin badgering him to move into a retirement home so that they can sell off the last of his property. Finally accepting that there is no place left for him in the changed world of the valley, and knowing that he will not be able to take Copper with him, the master grabs his shotgun and leads his faithful hound out into the woods. The final paragraph, which I'll read here, is particularly tragic. The master made him lie down, and then held one hand over his eyes. Copper lay trustingly and contentedly. The master knew best. Did he recall the many good times they had had together, and this last great run? A day and a night and part of another day? Of course he did. Copper gave the master's hand one last lick. He did not care what happened as long as he would never be separated from the master, for he had killed the great fox, and in this miserable, fouled land there was no longer any place for fox, hound, or human being. So after that, you may be wondering, why did Disney secure the rights to this novel? Because kids like animals. <sighs> Disney. Now, you probably noticed that the novel I just described bears almost no resemblance to the well-known Disney animated feature. Sure, the title is the same, as are the names of three of the main characters, but even then, Copper is the older dog in the book, while Chief is the younger, and neither of them ever has a friendship with Todd. Other than that, and the fact that Todd is orphaned and adopted by a human, later tricks Chief into running in front of a train, and has some form of rivalry with Copper, the two works are essentially unrecognizable from one another. And here's where things get a little conspiracy theory-ish. I'm gonna be honest with you. I, I'm kind of... In 1970, English author David Rook published a little-known and criminally underrated novel about fox hunting, The Ballad of the Bellstone Fox. The book opens with an orphaned fox being rescued and then adopted by a fox hunter, who allows it to be raised among the newborn hounds of that year. This fox, named Tag, develops a strong friendship with the runt of a dog litter, a hound named Merlin, and the two become inseparable, working together to become the dominant pair among their siblings. The lead huntsman, Asher Smith, hopes that by being raised alongside a fox, Merlin will gain additional skills as a hunting hound. And this does prove to be the case, but as a side effect of his friendship with Tag, Merlin develops no desire to kill foxes. Seeing this, the humans drive Tag away from his home and back into the wild, where he gradually adapts, but Merlin remains despondent over the loss of his friend. Just when his masters are about to give up on the hound, however, Merlin displays a remarkable penchant for being able to track Tag, who, due to being raised alongside hounds, has become expert in avoiding them. The excitement from the resulting chases leads to Tag becoming a legend among the local fox hunting community, and his old human masters are content to allow him to escape, until one day he leads the hunting pack in front of an oncoming train. Merlin survives, but several other hounds are killed, and Asher, the huntsman who raised Tag, feels responsible and is filled with a desire for revenge. The rest of the novel then follows the increasingly bitter rivalry between man and fox, with the hound caught in the middle. In the end, Asher is caught out in a storm and refuses to abandon his pursuit, cornering Tag in a small cave, only to collapse from exhaustion. Tag and Merlin reconcile, then help to keep the man warm before a rescue party arrives, and the huntsman finds it in himself to forgive the fox he raised, deciding to retire. It's a highly engaging read, one where both the human and animal characters are interesting and well-developed, and the author's extensive research into fox hunting and animal behavior makes it all the more interesting. And as fans of Disney's adaptation of The Fox and the Hound may have noticed by now, it probably sounds fairly familiar. Disney purchased the rights to The Fox and the Hound in 1967, but didn't begin production on their adaptation until a decade later, in 1977. In the meantime, the Ballad of the Bellstone Fox was published in 1970, and then adapted into a film that was released in 1973. 
meaning most likely, the film rights were secured very shortly after the novel's release. By the way, the film is alright. They made some weird changes to the script, particularly with the ending, and the production values are fairly middling, but the animal training is really impressive. If you're interested, the whole film is, let's say, easy to find if you're already on this site. But I'm getting off track. So what's my theory? Well, Disney is known for passing over the rights of books they feel are quote-unquote too dark. They actually did this for Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, a subject that will come up again. But the company is also known for internal disagreements about what is appropriate for their brand. My theory is that someone at Disney pushed for the acquisition of the Fox and the Hound, only for other executives to realize that it wouldn't make for a brand-friendly film. So a few years go by and they focus on other projects. But then someone at Disney stumbles upon a little-known book, The Ballad of the Bellstone Fox, and thinks, hey, this would make for a good movie. But the problem is, it's already been made into a movie, meaning they can't secure film rights for themselves. And we know how stringent Disney is about protecting their intellectual property. My name is Greed. The Avaricious. But, lo and behold, they still hold the rights to another novel about fox hunting, The Fox and the Hound. So they figure, why don't we just take elements from the Ballad of the Bellstone Fox and incorporate them into a quote-unquote adaptation of The Fox and the Hound? After all, most people don't even know this other book exists. As I said before, this is just a theory. Hey, that's speculation! I can't incontrovertibly substantiate these claims, but the timeline does add up, and the evidence seems to at least point vaguely in this direction. It would also explain why Mannix's novel has been out of print since the early 1970s, making it extremely difficult to secure a physical copy. Going by this theory, Disney would want to keep people in the dark as to the nature of the original novel in order to protect their brand, and to avoid competition with their junior novelizations of their supposed adaptation. Is that legal? Well, uh, technically, yeah. Uh... Now, if my theory was correct, would this constitute plagiarism? No, no it would not. I have no qualms with calling out Disney for their myriad terrible practices, be it running beloved IPs into the ground, exerting monopolistic control over an entire industry, practicing Hollywood necromancy, or even colluding with genocidal communist dictatorships. There is much money to be made. But I doubly repeat myself. Let's say China. With all of that being said, Disney's version of The Fox and the Hound is still quite different from the novel The Ballad of the Bellstone Fox. I just think it's worth noting how peculiar it is that Disney's film bears far more resemblance to this obscure English novel than it does to the title from which it was supposedly adapted. Regardless of the particulars, Walt Disney Animation Studios began work on their adaptation of The Fox and the Hound in 1977, ten years after acquiring the rights to the novel. The official reasoning given was that Wolfgang Reitherman, veteran Disney animator and by then one of the few remaining members of the old guard left at the studio, had experience with domesticated foxes and believed that the novel would make for a good movie. I have some other theories, but I digress. Reitherman was a member of the prestigious Nine Old Men, animators from the early days of Disney who dominated the studio for decades. But going into the 1970s, Disney found themselves in a state of transition as the Nine Old Men retired or passed away. The Fox and the Hound would prove to be the last Disney film in which any of the Nine Old Men were directly involved in the animation process as over the preceding years, their departures had made room for a newer generation of animators who often had very different views from the old guard. Among these new bloods were two up-and-coming animators who would each greatly help to shape the future of the American animation industry, Don Bluth and Ron Clements. Don Bluth had worked for various studios before joining Disney as an animator full-time in 1971, working on such projects as Robin Hood and the Rescuers before climbing his way up to animation director on the 1977 film Pete's Dragon. During his time at Disney, he became acquainted with two other like-minded newcomers, Gary Goldman and John Pomeroy, who came to share many of Bluth's concerns about the direction the company was taking. Ron Clements, meanwhile, had begun working as an animator for Hanna-Barbera before coming to Disney in 1975, apprenticing under another of the Nine Old Men, Frank Thomas. Positioned in the middle of the Nine Old Men and the incoming generation was Art Stevens, who had been with Disney since 1939 working on films such as Peter Pan, as well as a number of animated shorts. Wolfgang Reitherman was originally positioned to direct Disney's adaptation of The Fox and the Hound, while Stevens would serve as co-director. The only problem was, the two had some significant creative differences. For one, Reitherman was used to being heavily involved in supervising the animation process, an approach many of the younger animators found to be too constricting. Co-producer Ron Miller, 
the son-in-law of the late Walt Disney himself, backed Stevens' more laissez-faire approach. But Reitherman lacked trust in the less experienced animators, leading to a back-and-forth between the two that hindered development and generated anxiety and concern among many of the younger animators. Towards the end of 1978, after a year and a half of production, the last pieces of animation by members of the Nine Old Men had been completed, leaving the newer generation of animators to finish the film. But Reitherman, the last of the old guard, remained reluctant to trust his subordinates, and continued battling for control over various aspects of the developing film, driving many of the younger animators to support his co-director, Art Stevens, against him. A significant flashpoint arose on the subject of one of the movie's defining scenes, when Chief, chasing Todd, is led onto a trestle bridge, hit by an oncoming train, and thrown to the rocks below. This in turn fuels Copper and his master's desire for vengeance against Todd, creating the deep rift between the titular fox and hound that comes to define the rest of the movie, and is resolved in the climax. By the way, this is one of the very few aspects of the novel that was actually adapted into the movie. In the novel, Chief is killed, but Reitherman felt that this would be too dark for a Disney film, and for once, Art Stevens agreed. Ron Clements, Don Bluth, and others felt that Chief needed to die to be able to believably generate Copper's visceral hatred for his former companion. To quote Clements, Chief has to die. The picture doesn't work if he just breaks his leg. Copper doesn't have motivation to hate the fox. He's right. Stevens, however, adamantly refused, responding, Geez, we never killed a main character in a Disney film, and we're not starting now. I am SMHing and disgusting right frickin' now. Clements begrudgingly accepted Stevens' neutering of the script, but for many others, after dealing with Reitherman's overbearing supervision and excessive meddling, this proved to be the final straw. Which leads us to... On September 13th, 1979, Don Bluth, Gary Goldman, and John Pomeroy entered the office of producer Ron Miller. Here, they handed in their resignations, intent on starting an independent animation studio and producing films at a level of quality they felt the modern Disney environment was failing to achieve. Over the coming weeks, they would bring another 13 animators from Disney along with them in a crippling walkout that would set production back nearly a year on The Fox and the Hound. Bluth and his compatriots quickly formed Don Bluth Studios and set about animating a short film, Banjo the Woodpile Cat, in order to demonstrate their viability to potential investors. Meanwhile, back at Disney, executives scrambled to salvage the situation. Reitherman, the last of the nine old men, was forced to step aside to make way for Art Stevens as director, while the release date was pushed back from Christmas 1980 to summer 1981. Disney was forced to promote current animators while onboarding a number of new ones to fill the gaps left in the wake of Bluth's defection, leading to a hectic environment where the few veteran animators had to closely supervise their less experienced subordinates. In the end, after more than four years of troubled production, The Fox and the Hound released on July 10, 1981 to a strong box office showing and modest critical success. It has since become a fairly beloved entry in Disney's catalog, and that isn't necessarily undeserved. My personal thoughts on the movie? It's a pretty great 40-minute film buried beneath another 40 minutes of filler and fluff. Disappointed as I am that the film bears almost no resemblance to the excellent novel, I still have to admit that the main beats of the story are pretty strong, particularly the ending. Come on, Copper. Get out of the way. But this movie has so much filler, and the dramatic tension is severely undermined by jarring shifts into excessively childish bits and songs that make the film feel like it's being pulled in several very different directions, which it essentially was. I also wholeheartedly agree with the younger animators, who felt that having Chief inexplicably survive being hit by a train then falling dozens of feet into a shallow, rocky stream, does seriously impair the believability of the enmity between Copper and Todd. I'm fairly certain you could cut out nearly half of the runtime, and tweak a few shots so that it appears that Chief dies at the bridge, and you would have a much, much stronger movie as a result. But I digress. In the aftermath of the Bluth Mutiny and the end of the reign of the Nine Old Men, Disney Animation Studios entered what is widely considered to be its lowest stretch. Their next animated feature, The Black Cauldron, released in 1985 as the most expensive animated film ever made up until that point, only for it to bomb at the box office and leave the future financial stability of the studio in question. Their next film, The Great Mouse Detective, released the following year to modest success, 
But though it performed better than The Black Cauldron, it too failed to win the kind of recognition or cultural significance that had become all but expected of prior Disney films. Which is a shame, seeing as it's actually one of their best movies. Actually, it's elementary, my dear Dawson. It was during this period of turmoil that Disney found itself under new leadership, with CEO Michael Eisner and studio chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg joining the company in 1984. The first film to begin production under their reign was Oliver and Company, a loose retelling of the literary classic Oliver Twist, which was scheduled for release in November of 1988. But while the company had floundered during the 1980s, others had taken advantage of the changing landscape of American animation, chief among them Don Bluth. So, remember that novel I mentioned earlier, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, the one Disney passed over for being too dark? Well, Don Bluth and his colleagues felt otherwise, and took it upon themselves to forge an adaptation as their newly independent studio's feature-length debut. Beginning production on an adaptation of the novel in early 1980, with the financial backing of a former Disney executive, the team took a more traditional approach to filmmaking, favoring heavy emphasis on story and characters rather than catchy songs and colorful visuals, integrating complex perspectives and camera movements into the animation process, and refusing to shy from darker subject matter. The result was a veritable masterpiece of animation, The Secret of Nim, releasing in late 1982 to critical praise and modest financial success. The film proved that Bluth and his compatriots could not only match the quality of current Disney releases, but surpass them, and only four years later, in 1986, after partnering with Steven Spielberg, they followed up their debut with An American Tale. The movie released only six months after Disney's entry for that year, grossing more than twice what the Great Mouse Detective made on roughly two-thirds the budget, challenging Disney's long-held monopoly over the American animation industry. Unwilling to let their momentum evaporate, Sullivan Bluth Limited, the successor company to Don Bluth Productions, partnered with Lucasfilm, and along with Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment, set out to produce what would prove to be their biggest hit, The Land Before Time. November of 1988 saw the Bluth Spielberg Lucas triumvirate's entry facing off against the first Disney film to be fully produced with Eisner and Katzenberg at the helm, and for the first time in the history of American animation, a Disney film lost to a direct competitor at the box office in its opening weekend, with Oliver and Company grossing $4 million to The Land Before Time's $7.5 million. Though Disney's film would go on to be a huge financial success, it still demonstrated the company's vulnerability in a market that they had once held in an iron grip. In light of this challenge, Disney's leadership began to embrace the new ideas of its younger generation of animators and writers, while taking inspiration from their own classics, as well as films from around the world. These developments culminated in what is now known as the Disney Renaissance, a decade-long stretch in which ten animated films were released to massive critical and commercial success, cementing Disney's place as the leader in American animation for years to come. I was never really a huge fan of the Renaissance-era films myself, but, as the French say, Comme si, comme ça. Anyway. Interestingly enough, the first of these films, The Little Mermaid, was written and directed by Ron Clements, the animator who decided to stick it out with Disney when Bluth and so many others struck out on their own. It may seem strange to try and connect the reshaping of an entire industry to a little-known novel published in 1967, but, in a way, the publication of Daniel Mannix's The Fox and the Hound was like the assassination that sparked the diplomatic crisis that eventually gave way to a global conflagration, resulting in the restructuring of the international political order. Is that a weird application of that analogy? I feel like it is. But you get what I mean, right? If there's anything to take away from all of this, I suppose it's that seemingly insignificant events can end up having far-reaching consequences. Who can really say where the American animation industry would be today were it not for this bizarre string of occurrences? While I think it's unfair that the Fox and the Hound novel has faded into obscurity, unjustly reduced to little more than a mere footnote in the production of a decent animated film from the early 1980s, I suppose that's just the way things are. If the book sounds like something up your alley, and you have some time, I'd highly suggest reading it. And if you're interested in a more thorough analysis of Mannix's novel, you can check out my earlier video on the subject. Additionally, if you're looking for a new xenofiction read, I myself recently published my debut novel, Winter Without End, with Fenris Publishing, a post-apocalyptic survival story about a dog who makes an uneasy alliance with a wounded wolf in order to survive. As always, links for everything will be in the description. Anyways, that's all I have for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.
And a refusal to die from... <laughs> no. <laughs> to shy from darker subject matter. No, that was it. They refused to die. That was what was hindering animation. People had kept dying. But Don Bluth had had enough.